Welcome to Bridge and Voices, Konrad Adenauer's uh, Siftung podcast for multinational development policy dialogue in Brussels. This series is an open space to discuss relevant and sensitive issues all around the world with experts and to connect them with EU decision makers. My name is Laura Mellado and I'm thrilled to be today with you to discuss on the current situation of journalists and other media professionals with experts and authors of the recent study published by the Konrad Adenauer Siftung Democratic Media Strategy in the Global Context. First, I would like to greet Mr. Sias. He is CEO of Data Leads in India. He is an internationally renowned Indian journalist with more than 18 years of experience as a journalist, researcher and media educator. Hi, good morning. Pleasure to be here. Our second guest today is Mr. Andreas. He's a consultant and journalist in Germany. He has more than seven years' experience working as a lecturer and advisor for the German Academic Exchange Service at the Royal University of Fontaine in Cambodia. And before that, he was correspondent for a German newspaper in Brussels, London, and New York. Good morning. Good morning. And last but not least, we would also like to welcome Mr. Dapo. He's a publisher and CEO of the Nigerian newspaper Premium Times, which today is one of the most trusted newspapers in the country. Good morning. It's an honor. Thank you. Good morning. Without further ado, we're going to start the conversation about media and journalism. Can you explain me, please, what is the importance of this report right now Uh, freedom of speech has always been at the core of democracy, and I would like to um, to understand why this report is so important in this right moment. If you would like to yes. start. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, we try to uh, compare different countries, and of course uh, all these countries have different cultures, different history, um, but uh, our results are these, that there are tendencies uh, threatening the freedom of press and the freedom of speech. And uh, let me summarize four aspects uh, we found out. First of all, the growing attacks against democracy are accompanied by attacks against independent journalism. That means uh, even investigative journalism is losing ground. That means we don't have uh, journalists uh, who dare to investigate uh, sensitive issues like corruption, even also climate change. The second finding is that authoritarian regimes uh, try to build up uh, firewall against uh, internet and uh, this is uh, also a result of censorship and self-censorship. Uh, but we found out that uh, these regimes are actively engaged also in Uh, instigating propaganda and uh, this is uh, yeah our third issue that means uh, authoritarian narratives which are instigated by these regimes are uh, becoming more and more important and these narratives are often uh, connected to conspiracy uh, theories that means uh, a so-called bad guy is responsible for <laughs> for all the bad things in the world and uh, this is our conclusion That means the European Union so far has no consistent strategy to counter these attacks against uh, independent journalism. Thank you, Andreas. Uh -huh. I can hear that uh -huh. there are a political, economical, technological challenges for media and as well regulatory, of course. What is your opinion about and what are the insights that we can take from the Indian case? You know, I think, thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I, I, uh, As Andreas was discussing, you know, we are in a very unique position in the history of journalism. For the first time in the human history, we are creating more content, we are creating more information than we are able to consume. And it has a serious consequences for journalism. 
it has a serious consequences for societies because our ability to separate truth from falsehood is under unprecedented threat we have never seen this threat before journalists were trained for centuries how to collect information how to collect documents how to conduct interviews we would never train actually how to deal with something which we now know as a mis and disinformation we never saw it actually before the social media came into the picture i was 14 year old in 1990 which is not too long ago there was no google in the world there's no facebook in the world there's no whatsapp in the world there's no tiktok in the world and when all these big platforms came uh, it 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 helped to democratize the flow of information but it creates also its own challenges and uh, when you look at the democratic society is you tend to take a lot of things for granted the democracy for for granted the freedom of press for granted but we're learning globally that these are very precious things you need to protect them you need to go back again and again and check whether they're working the way they should work the free press is having the freedom it should have that it is serving as a watchdog I think the study essentially puts this whole conversation on spotlight looking at a case study from uh, you know one part of asia and then one part of africa two major continents again which will transform the 21st century in so many different ways is not going to be a european led world in 21st century no matter how much european union will like it to be that way it's going to be people will emerge countries will emerge from different centers of the world and they will lead and we certainly see without any bias asia as a major major player in the in 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 the global politics and the security of the you know like the in terms of uh, maintaining ensuring securities around the world so i think this study as uh, andreas rightly pointed out it identifies the challenges we are having it puts spotlight on things and is a very systematic uh, you know study done with the clear parameters also why they were selected and how we went through the process which is all explain uh in the in the report so i think that is that is the what really i i i about my understanding of the significance of this report is that it starts a conversation about why we need to protect free press and why we need to fight for free press thank you very much dapo i would like to hear from you uh do you agree with the diagnosis that andreas and said had presented to us what are the common trends as well for nigeria is uh, is there something significant that uh, you would like to highlight out of the challenges that the uh, nigerian press uh, press is having right now i think yes just as andrea and said has said um Sometimes it's difficult for us to understand the crisis that we confront in the media. Um, once we like to look at the profession, you know, as a standalone, as an extra social category, I think uh, a more beneficial way to look at, you know, our practice and its crisis is to relate it always to, you know, the project of democracy, uh, as you know. Um, what we are called to do in relation to democracy, it's very, and it's no more than probably three things. The media is a mechanism for accountability on the one hand. Uh, we also expect it, you know, to set the agenda for development, uh, create the normative basis for its own practice. And It is only when we see it in this context that, you know, the media, that journalism itself becomes, you know, uh, a medium of really creating the kind of uh, public sphere that gives democracy its vitality. Now, if you relate this to a situation in Nigeria, and probably in Africa, um, you, you notice that uh, because we've had a history most especially you know in the 70s into the 80s and in a place like Nigeria into the 90s a very long rule of authoritarian rule uh military rule in Nigeria lasted about 30 something years before we transitioned to democracy so we have built a culture of intolerance to opposition and particularly to uh press uh opposition um we have also you know created the notion that uh government 
um, mechanism of spokesmanship, uh, government radio, government TV, government supported newspapers, uh, more um, acceptable, if you like, you know, than what then looks very contrarian in what, you know, we expect journalism to do in it in a truly uh, independent world. Um, fast forward, I, I think, you know, while these are legacy issues for us, uh, it brought with it very a lot of authoritarian rules in our books. So statute is very, very constraining for the media. Uh, besides, you know, the whole, like in Nigeria, for instance, we have something like 18 laws that reign in against the practice of journalism itself. The second, of course, is the nature of regulation, especially in the broadcast sector. You know, um, it, these are treated like national security assets, if you like. An indication of this is what you, if you recall, the last year, June, Twitter, uh, Twitter ban in the country. Uh, this is a kind of instinct, you know, uh, in policy making that uh, drives their attitude to to media. Uh, you know, let me say that I think, uh, and I think they raised this point uh, obliquely, that at every point where society is making these kinds of transition, um, a lot of changes will happen, uh, and I'm talking here now specifically of the transition to digital, the digital transition that started in the middle of the 90s uh, changed everything for us here. Uh, media that itself had been quite weak now suffered, if you like, a double jeopardy. And uh, political challenges that always been there now face, you know, uh, an explosion, a technology-driven a challenge where information uh, driven by digital became so exponential. So we're dealing with a new time where information is so explosive and the means of regulating the information became free for all. Um, again, that, that led to the whole question of the economics of our media. Uh, totally draining resources, big technology had a big sweep. Uh, the advertising that always been there were drained off. Sales became, you know, atrophied. And um, so the media became far weaker than at any other time. So we had this lost politics and now economic becoming, uh, you know, the triple hedge that then kind of weaken our media at a time when, you know, uh, we really need to be fighting for greater issues of democracy, uh, expanding uh, access to development in many of our communities. The traditional challenges and callings of media became very difficult uh, to achieve uh, in the context of all this way. Uh, so these are just some of the, in a very uh, summative sense of what you might then call uh, the representation of this crisis, uh, therefore fostering more uh, authoritarian instincts in the Nigerian media uh, Thank you, and Nambu. environment. Uh, I may uh, Absolutely. Add, add some uh, something what uh, Syed said and uh, also Dapo. Uh, I, I'm looking back to my own career when I started journalism. We had this old stuff, telex system. That means uh, news mm. were uh, brought by by telex, and uh, we we had probably a few hundred news a day for a newspaper, but. It's a constant flood of news, what, what Syed said. So this is a really challenge for, for, the, for the journalist to sort out what is important and what is not important, but even more what is true and what is not true. And uh, this flood of information is, uh, I think this is one of the main theses of, of our study, is used by authoritarian regimes, because authoritarian regimes are a part of the state uh, propaganda, and they are flooding the 
uh, I would say, the journalistic ecosystem with news. What happened uh, when, when we look back to, to Trump in the United States? He had the same strategy together with Fox News, flooding the ecosystem with news, and nobody knows exactly what is true and what is not true. This is one of the main challenges for independent journalism to figure out, yes, uh, this is fake news and we have to transport this to the public and this is, we can rely on. You mentioned the yeah. example of Trump. I yeah. think that we all agree here. I would also like to, in, uh, to mm. ask you um, regarding the geopolitical context, uh, um, how other um, states or other uh, regional powers are as well affecting on the, on the plurality of media and uh, the rise of the some government um, practices towards uh, independent right. journalism. Right. No, I, I think uh, politicians, have eventually learned that if they have to rule a place, a country, they need to control the information. And uh, information is something which is, you can say, a, a basic right of a person to know what's happening all around him. As basic as during COVID-19, whether I will get a vaccine or not, will I die from this vaccine or not, or will I die this from, from this disease or not. So if people do not have a basic information, accurate information about who to vote, who to elect their leader, it creates confusion in the society. I think somewhere down the line, uh, given the rise of social media, and that why, that's why you see almost every politician in the world today is on Twitter, is on Facebook, has his own channel on, you know, on different social media platforms, because they realize that they can use social media to a large extent for campaigns, for propaganda, for creating a narrative or changing a narrative at a lot. This is a lot of investment by political parties in terms of building their capacities of handling their own social media accounts. I think most of major political parties today around the world have a dedicated teams within their political system which will handle social media for them. So that again, I think it's like a very clear understanding within the you know the parties before elections, after elections, how to engage media or how to engage people by passing you can say traditional media, newspapers, and TV stations and all, which most of parties anyway are not really paying so much attention anymore because they know people engage on social media more, so they create the you know lot of in information. So WHO came up with this uh, you know very good and accurate term infodemics, it's, uh, it's like so much information. And then people eventually tend to get confused before elections, how to vote and all. And we see this in our part of study as well. We have seen uh, uh, how uh, the traditional um, newspapers for that metro or TV stations have been bypassed in a lot of regions actually, just to make sure that uh, the messaging goes directly in a one way. There's no communication. There's no gatekeeping, there's no fact-checking, anybody can post anything and can manipulate or create a narrative on, 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 on situations where there are no facts to support that. Like, for example, you claim something and you spread it across and you say it 10 times a day, people start believing it. They start, you give them a hoarding at the airport, hoarding at a railway station with a message. When they see it one time a day, two times a day, 10 times a day, they start believing it. So the, the whole messaging, the political messaging is actually undermining the role of journalists, particularly at a time where the media is also having other challenges, the financial challenges, being sustainable. And we are seeing globally the traditional media is struggling with the financial model. And this gives states to, in some states at least, in some countries, a, a liberty to manipulate them actually by giving them say uh, extra ads, by giving them a space in terms of sponsorships and then taking over ownership as well through corporates. And we have seen in case of India, for example, uh, we did an extensive study about media ownership. And it, from a distance, it looks like, like India has 100,000 newspapers, 500, more than 500 TV stations. So from a distance, it looks like you have a lot of choice. 
as a reader, as a viewer, you can have multiple points of views. But when you look at essentially, you know, you, you study the content and all, you figure out all the 500 TV channels, for that matter, for the newspaper, essentially are saying one thing. There's no choice for a viewer to understand. And why is this happening, particularly on crucial issues? Why that is happening? Because it's like a one corporate in India owning 40 media stations. The concentration of media ownership with few actually creates an unprecedented challenge again. Because you feel you're free, you have free freedom and everything, but somewhere up, you know, somebody is pulling the ropes, what they should write and not write. That's why you see the role of investigative journalism, which was essentially the cornerstone of journalism, is slowly, slowly dying in a lot of parts of the world, including in India for that matter. So we are not seeing watchdog reporting at a level which should have been there, where the history is there. There have been reports, there have been major investigations done by newspapers which were debated in the parliament, in assemblies, laws were changed because of work of journalists. That work is not happening anymore, you know, like uh, on key issues. Uh, Dapo, I would like to ask uh, your opinion as well regarding media ownership in Nigeria and what is the impact of um, uh, the government's situation there, the regulation, and as well the, the important flow of information that Sid was uh, talking about. Well, okay, thank you. Um, you know, so historically for us, um, because the media started as a print uh, phenomenon, uh, the first newspaper was 1859. Um, so, it, and because once it started, it also uh, helped to fight for independence and things like that. So its initial instinct, its DNA, if you like, has been established as a very uh, contrarian, um, fairly independent at origin, and increasingly as it grew in confidence with better uh, capacity in its practice, uh, it was able to establish itself uh, in a way that broadcasting could not. Uh, unfortunately, you know, given the whole uh, literate culture that we're also dealing with, newspapers we are bound to be very urban, uh, restricted circulation uh, kind of uh, uh, platforms for information exchange and for all the great values that we expect that media to bring. Um, broadcasting did not have its uh, private until 1993. So, in a sense, you have this broad divide where uh, broadcasting is just imagined to assert itself as an independent force uh, to be able to uh, provide the kinds of uh, demands in a democracy that we expect, which we've spoken about earlier. How do you bring power to account? How do you check the excesses of power? Uh, how do you actually set the agenda for a very uh, vigorous development, uh, helping to stem those uh, practices like corruption, you know, um, extra uh, judicial abuse, which are so rampant? Um, so that narrowed if you like, that's already created one wedge between the world of the print and the world of broadcast. And the government, successive governments understand this, and they have played heavily on it. Um, unfortunately, and I will say, is that as, as we are emerging out of you know, this uh, central challenge, uh, dictatorship, military dictatorship in the country was congealing so that most of the years of the 70s and most of the years of the 80s uh, into the 90s were very, very difficult years. Uh, where the media now had to struggle and assert itself. Um, so it, it's really been very challenging. I mean, I, I, I could, in fact, isolate the years, say, between uh, the 1985 till... Uh, effectively, uh, 
89, when, the, when we returned to democracy, as some of the most brutal years, a whole lot of journalists went into exile, a number were killed, newspapers were shut down. and th- So that's the governance period, you know. Uh, in spite of all this, one can still speak of great periods where the media continue to help assert itself, apart from its history of helping to or fight for the country's independence. Is the, the one of the biggest uh, outcomes of all this is just how we were able to help make a case for the return to democracy, keep fighting, you know, incidences like corruption and so on. So you raise the point, and I just want to quickly make one, uh, what I imagine is a very important point, that is, that, you know, I think the discussion, we have this kind of debate constantly here in Nigeria, is to always situate, you know, what we do in journalism in the context of, you know, democracy. Um, And if we're going to do that, it then becomes imperative on us to understand that what democracy demands in every context of the media is that, you know, first and foremost is that you you provide, you know, the non-state, if you like, uh, accountability mechanism for that process of that democracy. Even as you are also helping to set concrete agenda for development, um, these are the key issues that we then wrestle with. Uh, my point is that, look, if you come to, uh, and probably this is global, but certainly I can say in, a, in an African setting, this is what we face. Most of the countries in Africa came into the transition to digital, say, around 1995-96. The legacy of the media that this transition inherited was such that these media were themselves already struggling with very, very repressive regimes. Uh, and w- 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 with this new advent, what we had is two broad challenges at one point where, you know, uh, the digital divide created. It, a, a challenge of professionalism and a, a challenge of uh, trust uh, purely because, you know, it created this exponential access which had no regulatory framework in the way that we have always understood uh, regulation in the, in the context of Kinesro. So w- what we do in terms of the information we gather, how we distribute the information and how we raise revenue for our practice changed overnight. And then that's really created bedlam in the industry. Uh, and that's what then led, in essence, you know, all complicated, not led, you know, to those kinds of information disorder crisis, either as misinformation uh, or indeed as uh, this information we are Okay, so, um, so I'm saying that, so whereas we have this on the one hand um, as one crisis, so we have a crisis of information in the sense that this explosion then just overwhelms a practice that was itself already weak. And it's compounded on the other hand by, you know, the revenue crisis, which I think uh, Andre has just spoken about, which just led to a challenge of how do you then make this media sustainable? So that if indeed in the face of this challenge of building democracy, building development, and we expect a whole lot from the media to be able to help drive these processes, but this media is already shackled, you know, politically uh, through legal regimes and now compounded by just new economic forces that make it impossible. Make. Nigeria's own situation then became a little unique, you know, because 
I can see here Andreas and Sid, they are both shaking their when hands. I can see that both uh, Andreas and, yeah. uh, and Sid, so, they are shaking their heads, uh, agreeing with you. Maybe they want to, to, <laughs> to compliment what you're saying about sustainability. Okay. Yes, this this is one of the main. Uh, I'll let them talk. <laughs> okay, thank thank you, Dapa. Uh, I agree yeah. totally. This is one of the main uh, issues of independent journalism in uh, our finding. Also, regarding Cambodia, is is very clear. Of course, Cambodia is a very small country with around 16 million inhabitants, and you cannot compare it with uh, India or. Nigeria, but uh, the, the I would say the problems are uh, pretty much the same. First of all, the ownership of media. Uh, most of the TV stations in Cambodia are owned by people who are very, very close to the ruling class and uh, also to the family of, of the Prime Minister Hun, Hun Sen who rules the country since uh, for, for 37 years or something like this. And so we, we have the problem of ownership. Then we have the second problem of uh, how to find a voice for, for young journalists. And I would be also a little bit optimistic because I see that as long as the internet is uh, more or less free, young people have an opportunity to to spread their voice. Uh, it's not the same if if you have the chance to uh, working for for a big media outlet. But we have in Cambodia a very lively social media uh, scene, and that means also young journalists are keen to spread their voice and and they are keen to investigate sensitive issues but uh, we have the third problem and this is the legal system that means on paper we have in cambodia uh, freedom of press and freedom of speech this is a very rare situation in southeast asia because uh, Cambodia had had the support of the United Nations after the peace agreement in 1991 and uh, therefore we have also a very democratic constitution there. But on the other hand is what is the situation on the ground? That means we have on the one side we, we have freedom of press guaranteed by the by the uh, by the law but the situation on the ground is very much different. That means uh, the regime tries to stifle uh, freedom of, of press. And uh, uh, I had to study that in the last two to the three years, uh, 72 journalists in Cambodia are even put to, put, to, uh, put to trial or even put into prison. That means the situation, there, there is a clear dis discrepancy between the legal uh, system and, and the situation on the ground, what the re regime does with, with uh, critical journalists. And I guess that okay. might be the, the same problem also. No, it, so it, it, it's worse, actually, to be, yeah. honest. It's worse actually yeah. to be honest, because I feel yeah. like, uh, as Dapa was also mentioning, the mm. challenges. What are mm. the challenges uh, media faces uh, today across the world? And we, particularly in the countries where mm. we did the research, we can say the challenge of mm. mis- and disinformation to undermine the traditional media, the challenge of ownership, the challenge of physical security for the journalists. In the last, at least in last year, uh, there have been four journalists who were killed and assassinated in India. Uh, you know, the challenge for journalists, as we have been discussing, you know, uh, there are a couple of major challenges we are seeing. One is certainly the challenge of rising mis- and disinformation, which undermines the ability of the press also to figure out what is true and what is not true because of the, the capacities to check online and verify online information. Media ownership is a massive challenge and uh, uh, states and non-state actors are using different ways to procure media houses. 
We have seen this happening increasingly in India, where the major businesses are actually procuring uh, media companies. One company in particular owns more than twenty news outlets and single ownership, and you can just imagine the kind of journalism you can expect uh, from those publications when the owner is directly involved uh, and he has different business interests, has nothing to do with media. And I think physical security is alarmingly a major issue back home in India. And in in the last five years, there have been at least twenty journalists who have been killed and assassinated because of their work. And uh, there's no uh, you can see a, a body out there to even fight legal cases for journalists to protect them from a lot of defamation cases. Which uh, which is uh, which is increasingly used to silence good journalism. So what's happening because of all all these attacks on journalism? There's a massive self censorship happening. The editors are not writing. The reporters are somehow not feeling confident enough to investigate stories. And in most of organizations, uh, ironically, journalists are getting paid not to write and not to report. And it's alarming. And that's why that's why. Uh, given the kind of situation we are in, the challenges we are having on public health, on on climate change, on on basic rights, equality, minority rights, we are not seeing these stories being covered by a large number of major mainstream news publications. And you, from a distance, wonder why is a, 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 a outlet based in Berlin or based in London or based in New York covering these stories? And why is not Indian press, the major mainstream press, covering these stories? And uh, but I think in every challenge there are, you can say, a, you know, like a opportunities, and there are, you know, like the signs of hope, as signs of being optimistic. And we have seen in the last five, six years, there's been increasingly a tremendous, you know, crave for entrepreneurship in media by young startups. And who have um, done amazing work in the last, I can see, like five, ten years. We have organizations which are millions of viewers, and they're just like four, five, ten people, and they're doing some amazing work, groundwork, community-based stories, and they're fact-checking. India today has the highest number of IFC and signatories, highest number of IFC and signatories who fact-check millions and photos, and videos every day. And in the last four years. We at the data least have been extensively invested in this idea that we need to build new capacities and new ecosystem. And one of these major projects which we are running, which is supported by the Google News Initiative called Google News Initiative India Training Network, we have been actually able to train more than forty thousand editors and journalists on key fact-checking tools and techniques. And we have we have we have involved and built a network of more than five thousand newsrooms across the country. So I think the challenge for us here is uh, we are not is- living in isolation, as like a Nigeria living in isolation, or Cambodia living in isolation, or India for that matter, living in isolation. We are all working in a world where we have access to the same technologies now and internet and everything is democratized democrat- that way. And I think Europe has a major responsibility here. Let me before yeah. going back to, to to Europe. That of course we will have um, uh, some some minutes to discuss about it. I would like to ask Dapo because Nigeria is one of the uh, uh, most dangerous countries to 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 be a journalist. Um, what 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 is the uh, I mean? Um, see, it was mentioning now physical um, security for journalists. How is it the situation in Nigeria? It's been it's been a little bit uh, of a challenge. Actually, it's. Uh, on the rise um, and what we we had in say 20, 2020 uh, was a particularly uh, difficult year that year alone uh, we talk, I mean, well, both the reporters uh, RSF, CPJ and the local uh, uh, press attacks Tracker here was reporting something like 72 attacks on the media, uh, quite as close to about 38 arrests, you know. Um, and we saw significant things like, you know, uh, legal amendments of the lawful uh, intervention where, you know, the, the state could 
really uh, invade your digital rights. Uh, we saw a lack of willingness by the state to give coherence, you know, to data protection bills. And of course, a most centurion uh, regulator was imagined. So that's really been a very, very difficult uh, challenge. We're going to an election year, a traditionally election year also uh, leads to this kind of worsening of situations, you know, where uh, security institutions and apparatuses will then uh, take stand out. This has been the tradition uh, in, our, in our country. Uh, but besides a little bit of this physical uh, uh, challenge that we face, um, which is key for us to be able to practice journalism, uh, is that it is it, you find yourself related to even those questions. Sid mentioned it, and I just thought to bring it up again: uh, the whole question of uh, uh, pluralism in our media. That's one of the key challenges of the the moment that we face. We're going um, there. We're going, yes. So actually we're going to talk about plurality and pluralism and, um, and we, we have been so far discussing the external context to the journalist, but actually journalists, we are individuals and we're responsible of what we are reporting as well and, uh, and uh, how accountable to, we are. Um, I would like to ask you, Andreas, um, I mean, um, how a, a journalist should professionally behave and uh, to try to, um, to 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 report with accuracy and uh, what 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 are the, the the main responsibilities of a journalist? Um, yes, I would say uh, of course a journalist shouldn't be a political activist. And uh, if we look around in the world, we see political activism by journalism uh, all over the place. And uh, even in Cambodia, but also in Europe, we have uh, intense discussion also in Germany about bias of journalism. And uh, I must say, uh, there are some clear causes that uh, journalists tend to uh, yes, support uh, political issue and on the other hand they don't care about uh, contradictory uh, facts and this is even due to this is independent if, if I look to developing countries or so-called developed uh, countries and uh, but of course we, we, we have a specific uh, problem we observed also in Cambodia because Cambodia is a very poor country and uh, the salary of journalists in Cambodia is around, uh, I would say, if, if you are working uh, for a media outlet between 300 and 400 US dollars. And that means this can't cover the, the livelihood of, of a family. That means journalists who are working for a media outlet are, uh, I would say, vulnerable for uh, yes, for some kind of, of money. And this is exactly what happens in Cambodia if you are investigating, uh, investigating uh, sensitive issues like uh, deforestation. Uh, you will meet as a journalist some, some guy, some guy for, 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 uh, from a timber company and he will tell you, of course, you will get from me $1,000 and then you, you shouldn't write about this sensitive issue. And this happens in Cambodia and I'm sure this happens also in, in other countries. So um, I see that there are different problems in, uh, uh, in Cambodia and if you compare it with uh, so-called developed countries, but we, we, we have also a big, big issue of... of bias of journalism and again I would say uh, the main task is not to be a political activist. What about you? What do you think? No, I think uh, when you fail to perform your duties as a watchdog, as an independent mm. media, the state has every reason actually to exploit you. What's happening with journalism also when you look back and do a little introspection, you realize that 
we are not being so honest with our work and uh, in india for example one of the best things a uh, m- m- lot of editors eventually think of after spending 40 years in journalism is to how to get a ticket to parliament and they start lobbying in the final years of journalism uh, to go closer to a particular party so that they can reach parliament and be there and which is sad and unfortunate to be honest because it undermines uh, the whole uh, you know uh, the essence of journalism eventually that you should stay out of the power i remember one of the amazing editors we had in india the indian express ramnath goenka and a politician praised one of his reporters in front of him that he is doing a good job and next day he sacked that correspondent he said how a politician is praising my reporter what does that mean actually so that was the standards we had there was a standards we remember in, in during the emergency in india during the prime minister indira gandhi's rule the editors went to jail to protect the free speech protect the free media unfortunately that strength we don't have that strength anymore there's uh, there's there no board. we have a press council of india we have a editors guild of india we have press councils in every state in india but unfortunately somewhere down the line they're not able to pursue or they're not able to actually maintain some bit of conversation how significant it is for us to clean our own house to be truthful journalists and when people are also parachuted in newsrooms by different owners again the ownership question by different owners to create a content which is false which is which is not really evidence based so you are not having mechanism actually and practices on the ground when you actually lead by saying we aren't doing truthful work and believe me there are journalists remarkable editors and journalists still in newsrooms in few newsrooms still who do amazing work protecting their integrity protecting their work doing investigation even today uh, you know under very different situations and conditions but i think the challenge and danger here is that if you do not really clean your stuff then the state has more reasons to come with more regulations and more laws which will be fundamentally against the freedom of speech then if you don't self regulate if you don't really take care of your own mistakes and errors and if you don't have a clarification policy you know we have a newspaper the hindu one of the finest newspaper in india they made sure if they do any error in anywhere in the story they had the readers column where the editor will come and say this mistake was committed on a front page and he will mention the mistakes and everything and so that the trust is there because eventually the whole journalism the relationship with, with the editors reporters and the public is based on trust if you do not have that trust there's no journalism unfortunately unfortunately for us we are seeing people do not really trust media majority of people do not really trust in media in india we still remember when we were growing up people were actually buying a newspaper at a railway station and one person will buy a copy and the the copy will circulate to the whole you know the the the, the booth actually and everybody will read that newspaper and people will trust every word published in newspaper as a gospel today i don't think anybody can say that oh i read it in a newspaper i watched in a tv station i trust it absolutely not so i think the challenge for us is how can we build our own competencies our own understanding and our own you know like a, uh, the significance of journalism how can we really understand the separate that what is journalism why are we here i remember uh, mahatma gandhi when he came from johannesburg a father of the nation when he came from johannesburg to fight british all he brought from johannesburg to fight british was a typewriter and his first newspaper and he started writing columns and opinions and he started he became the mass leader by that and he had this beautiful saying journalism in essence is a public service so i think somewhere down the line we have to go back to our fundamentals to protect it to build innovation in journalism take advantage of technologies look at the future very differently there are different challenges going to be are we ready for those challenges i think the study really puts the focus on two these two key things the role of free press independent press and democracies you cannot have a democracy without hang- having a vibrant press you can't call yourself a democratic country if the media is not independent the media is not free to report i think this is uh, this is bottom line and i think the governments really need to also understand that the states need to understand that that the, it's good for the country if we have a free press if we have an independent press 
a flourishing press where they write report and make the government accountable is there yeah. something yes sorry yes, and yes Saya, thank you for, uh, for your commentary. I, I think the main term is uh, yeah, how to be independent. And uh, I myself know a time when I was a correspondent here in Brussels. We were always invited by the commissioners also for international travel. And they covered all the costs uh, by flight and by hotel. And uh, so uh, from standards today that wouldn't be possible because uh, at least you have to pay for yourself or your media outlet uh, has to pay for, for, for the travel if you go with a commissioner. But I think in general there is a very, very fine line between, uh, I would say, biased uh, corruption maybe also in the worst case and uh, independent journalism and even if you go with the German uh, chancellor by flight to Canada or to the United States. My question is, would you write about him in a very negative way if you are always invited, even if your media outlet pays for the, for, for the flight? Uh, so these are all questions. I don't, I don't have a perfect answer about this because I think it's possible. It's even uh, necessary that journalists uh, are with politicians, but they have to keep distance, 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 distance. And to be honest, I don't see this in the public uh, broadcast in Germany even now. Dapo, I uh, would like to hear yeah. your opinion on that. Yeah. How can we build trust yeah. again on the on the public? How can we continue being independent on uh, on the on the, the, the governments and at the same time being accountable? Well, you know, I mean, and uh, I first of course I have to adopt uh, what my colleagues on the panel have said. Um, however, you know one can add the little point that the challenge of the media today uh, is that gatekeeping has become one of the most uh, difficult uh, uh, practice to to insist on you know we can within the framework of the more established newspapers the more established uh, organizations broadly uh, keep reminding ourselves that look journalism as a project of democracy absolutely has no meaning or consequence if it is not defined by truth telling it has to be truthful you know uh, uh, our reporting must be accurate this is what journalism means it's not just the ability to be able to write or you know <laughs> or do good storytelling you know, why we're different from fictional writers is because our own accounts are absolutely uh, truthful. And um, we have to provide verification. Indeed, I think one of the very interesting definitions of journalism uh, is to give currency to that point. It says that journalism is a practice in verification, just to emphasize the point. So at a difficult time like this, where we face the explosion of uh, uh, information, where we have easy entry uh, into to media, uh, I think it's to double down, you know, um, on some of the received principles, <laughs> one of which is, of course, that journalism must be defined by truth and accuracy. I think second to that is that we can incorporate new protocols, one of which is, you know, fact checking, which has now become very, uh, an interesting newsroom uh, component, you know, because what fact checking does in the context of today's newsroom is that it helps us to reinforce the truth value of our reporting. And hopefully that then draws us. We had a particular experience with this, the newspaper that uh, I work for, we, 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 we were founded just 10 years ago. And at that time, it's very interesting, you know, the whole media landscape in Nigeria was in total shambles. And many people, in fact, when we said we were going to create a new 
newspaper, they said, well, how are you going to? There's, in fact, no scope, no opportunity for even, you know, any horizontal displacement in the industry. We said, no, we're going to try. And, and it was rewarded. So we introduced an investigative only kind of uh, reporting. So people got to trust the paper a little bit more than our peers, because at least they could say. So products like, you know, investigative reporting, uh, data, data reporting, uh, data journalism, which then gives more uh, clarity and analysis of events. These are little, little protocols we can introduce into our practice. Definitely fact checking. It's one very powerful tool that has helped. I think as what some of the things we also experiment with is to, to do uh, effective uh, media monitoring, which helps us in fact to become self aware of our own practice and our failures and weaknesses. Uh, but, you know, I think Andre raised a point which I just want to uh, extend a little bit is the fact that, you know, we, we came this long in believing that our independence is defined only in very legal and political terms. I think it's absolutely uh, important to know that independence today has incorporated elements of the economy. Economic foundations of or what you generally in business studies will call business model. The fact that the received business model of journalism has come into, you know, uh, it's falsified. It's, it's, it's in need of innovation, if you like. Um, and if that's going to be, then advertising, sales, and events, which were the traditional way of defining our business model in the media, at least in most developing countries, those are incapable of growing it again. Uh, when I was a young reporter, the, and the paper every Nigerian kid who wanted to do journalism or look up to was doing, you know, uh, 750,000 copies a day to, you know, uh, 900,000 copies a day. Today that paper has totally disappeared. In the whole of this country, <laughs> it's, it's strange to say, uh, the most populous African nation. There's no newspaper that today that's even selling 50,000 copies a day. Um, I think this is important to understand is that it is fundamentally a consequence of digital because the biggest newsroom in, as far as I, <laughs> I will say, in any African country today uh, is, is Facebook. You know, in Nigeria, 27 million people uh, accessing news through Facebook on a daily basis. So uh, the digital transition has reconfigured the whole landscape, and all this is telling us we also have to renew both our understanding and our response to those important principles like independence uh, uh, around the practice and our industry. Uh, my, my suggestion on this is that because independence today um, is tied to the whole question of how sustainable the media is. And if it cannot be sustainable because the advertising foundation for revenue making is really not there, or at least got been uh, scooped up by big technology companies, we then have to think in innovative ways how to renew this business model. The challenge of sustainability today is tied to business model innovation. And uh, I know that there's very interesting kinds of things that are going on in India. Um, so we have to talk more. And uh, I know we're coming back to talk about how the EU must really help because you can't build democracy really uh, say it, say it. I, I take that as catechism and a religion. You can't have a democracy if you can't have an independent media, you know. And uh, and it's not one person's problem. So this is a very global issue, you know. Uh, the Chinese are doing very well, you know, in Nigeria. Um, 
the online media is in explosion. Many of that are like crap. You know, people, anybody wakes up today and just set up an online platform and the politicians pay for that, you know. <laughs> so they pollute the whole landscape. So we must find the kinds of resources that will help strengthen uh, independence and fairly more robust and stronger kind of media platforms. Um, and that's really going to be the challenge of the future. Uh, otherwise, you. you know, uh, yeah. Sorry, that, that, that I can go on and on. <laughs> I understand. Uh, me too. I can also continue talking for hours with you. Thank you very much for these uh, inputs. I would like to know how can the European Union help you? Can we um, develop the context that you need in order for media professionals and, uh, and for independent journalism to, to professionally perform their duties? Um, wants to start Andreas maybe Said. yeah no I, I, to be honest I don't think like this, uh, it's like European Union helping countries to be honest I think it's like a commitment to a common cause and Europe stands on some values of about free press independent media rule of law democracy these are global you know like uh, core areas of our existence in a free society I think uh Europe has to raise to occasion and they are too much busy in their own domestic politics and they're so divided on so many different things. And then they often complain, why is not India part of their dialogue? Why is not Nigeria part of their dialogue? But they never really realize that what is their investment in the relationships. So when you are investing uh, and you're having a very strong bilateral relationship with, say, for example, with India on climate change, India is a key partner on climate change, on defense on national security, in NATO dialogues, in so many other areas of bilateral engagement. But what is your commitment to a free speech in India? When was the last time any European leader stood up and said, something is going wrong, we need to do something about it? When was the last time you really invested in building ecosystem in, in, in Asia for that matter? I see Europe is absolutely missing from a big picture. Are they uh, pretty much busy in their own domestic politics, keeping French happy or you know Germans happy for that matter? And they never really reach to this consensus that where they they're missing a, a global opportunity to sustain a system somewhere down the line. You know, if you're not there, somebody else will occupy that position. That's what really is happening. Look at China and look at a relationship with Sri Lanka. Look at relationship with China and Nepal. Look at relationship with so many other countries. But Europe is not able to be a partner. Somebody else is willing to invest and be in partner in that relationship. And that creates a huge challenge. And if you look at the present situation as well, of course, the terrible situation in Ukraine and the Russian onslaught out there. But there are other challenges in the world where Europe really has not really tried to figure out that the challenge of mis- and disinformation is not only about the Ukraine war. There are other situations where this onslaught, a dis- and misinformation is really big. And we have not seen any investment from European Union or European member states into the misinformation ecosystem in, for that matter in Asia. Like we work across, uh, you know, like the region. I see individual countries, like for example, I think Germany has done excellent work uh, in promoting and uh, building capacities in journalism universities in a couple of Asian countries. But there's a one member state and again individual capacity of that member state. We don't see European Union coming up with ideas of collaboration, of partnership, a high-level partnership. So that whole relationship is missing. And in this report, I think we spent good time at the end of it actually identifying the, the areas where Europe actually can be a good partner. All they need to do is to, well, they do partnerships on defense and security and climate and a lot of other areas. They need to make sure that they have media, they see media. It's not only about telling their own people here in Brussels that media is an important part of democracy. It's also making part of, like, every agreement you do with any country, you need to put a column there that if you're not supporting independent freedom, this is not going to happen. We are not going to be partner with you. The way you do with climate change, every future deal in climate, you're, you're keeping some clauses there, tick marks, that you, you're, you're, you're protecting these things, these things, these things, and then you're moving ahead with the climate change deal with that particular country. I think in every bilateral agreement the European Union is having with any country, we need to tick mark independent media, the guarantee to protect 
independent media in that particular country. Thank you. What about Andreas? Um, okay, thank you for for your uh, very positive remarks. Of course, Europe has its own problems with democracy. If I'm looking to Hungary and also the uh, uh, new member states, we we have we have a lot of problems with. Uh, yeah checks and balances and so so sometimes it will be difficult for europe to be a role model uh, but i agree uh, the uh, overall issue is about democracy and we we have certain criteria for this and if we can fulfill this from the european side but also from the uh, from india side this this would be very helpful so this as a, as a small remark, uh, the second issue is what what can can be done by the European Union. Uh, be honest, I'm a little bit hesitant uh, regarding direct financial aids for media outlets because uh, then we will run into the problem of state-owned media we we have it in china we we have it in russia all uh, in in these authoritarian regimes and we won't uh, we we do not want to copy this so uh, i think the main issue is uh, how to support independent journalism and first of all this might be qualification of young journalists okay i must admit this needs also uh, sometimes of financial aid, but if we look at the universities, in, in, uh, for, for example, in Cambodia, there's a big need for technology, there's a big need for qualified uh, professors and uh, to build up uh, qu qualified journalism. So this, this would be the first issue, how to support young journalism and the ed education of journalism. Uh, the second thing is, uh, we found out even in Cambodia, there, there is a lack of, uh, I would say, close relationships between the EU delegations because they are the representatives in, in, in different countries and the media scene. Uh, for example, in Cambodia, I must say, the delegation is more or less absent in the media uh, sector. And, and there is a potential uh, to, uh, to, to build up regular briefings, to build up information about the European Union and uh, to uh, briefings about democracy in general. So there is a potential for the delegations uh, to engage uh, much more than uh, currently. So these, these are two aspects, qualification of journalists, EU delegations, and then, of course, uh, the whole issue of fake news, uh, we know that the European Union is already engaged in debunking uh, fake news, but I would say this uh, should be enhanced also regarding Chinese uh, fake news. So far, what, what I read, the European Commission is very much engaged in debunking Russian fake news, but we, sh we should have a, a broader view also to the uh, Chinese strategy, how to influence public uh, opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, launch the same question to Dapo, really uh, concisely, please, if you can share with us what are your views. Um, I think um, um, we have to, and I have just very three uh, short responses here. That I think the EU can step up a little bit uh, in its uh, engagement with uh, places like uh, our own communities here um, by investing more in democracy building uh, and I say this in the sense not only as opposing China uh, but making very concrete and consequential investments for instance I think 
there should be a need to tie uh, media freedom or independent uh, journalism agreement uh, to the uh, kinds of partnership uh, agreements that we enter with uh, countries like ours. You know, it should be a very clear clauses there that this is part of what, you know, we expect that is done. If you want aid from from the EU, you must also give uh, evidence that you're promoting media freedom and independent journalism. Uh, I think also, and this is very, very important, because uh, for us, as we see it, it's going to be the terrain of the next big battle in, in, in media freedom, is a question of the digital migration and broadcasting. Um, and if you look at Africa as a broad sweep today, from end to end, China is in total control of the digital migration. What that's saying is that the future of broadcasting in Africa uh, is going to be almost wholly controlled, you know, uh, by the Chinese. So the, the technology uh, content, as we are now saying, effectively, you know, uh, production, um, that's really scary, I must say. Uh, lastly, I think we, we, we should see something more about encouraging uh, cross-border kinds of reporting between uh, African journalism and newsrooms uh, within the EU. Uh, the EU should itself foster these kinds of very uh, aggressive uh, partnerships because then it also insulates uh, the journalism in uh, in Africa, from its uh, typical uh, question that we will see. Lastly, uh, I and this is under said this, and I think Said has said it. It's also that you know, education is very important capacity. I I, I think the EU should uh, more pointedly and very clearly uh, show willingness to invest in the capacity uh they they claim indeed that you know <laughs> democracy would work here if we don't invest in independent journalism uh these are just a few points that i think might be something to take along thank you very much thank you very much uh gentlemen has been a pleasure uh sharing this moment with you uh, I could be talking uh, for hours with you, learning from you, uh, from three main voices, from India, from uh, Germany, but with your experience in Cambodia, and of course from Nigeria. Thank you very much. I invite our viewers or listeners to check the report. It's, uh, it's, uh, you're going to find all the key points that we have discussed here today and many more. And, and thank you very much for watching.